This is A New Angle, a show about cool people doing awesome things in and around Montana. I'm your host, Justin Angle. This show is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. Hey folks, welcome back and thanks for tuning in. Today's guest is Elliot Woods, a multimedia journalist based in Livingston, Montana. Life in a certain sense is not actually precious. That was a big turning point in my life where I realized that you can have all these dreams and all these things you want to do with the rest of your life and this vision of your future. But the reality is that you can be obliterated in a second in spite of all of that. Elliot is a veteran and his work has been published in Outside Magazine, The New Republic, and The Wall Street Journal, among other prominent outlets. Elliot recently released a powerful and sobering account of the war in Afghanistan and its enduring effects. The podcast, titled Third Squad, chronicles his journey to reconnect with a group of Marines Elliot embedded with in 2011. Elliot, thanks for coming on the show. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Where did you grow up and what did your parents do? So I grew up in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. in a place called Gaithersburg. And then my parents split up when I was pretty young. So I spent part of my childhood in central Pennsylvania. And then I spent a lot of my formative years in Virginia, okay. in Richmond and Charlottesville. And that's uh, where I was when I enlisted in the military, which is a story we should probably come back to at some point. Sure. But I had a suburban life outside of Washington, D.C., and then I had a, a country life up in central PA when my dad moved up there. So I got good parts of both of those worlds. And my father was a Navy physician at the Naval Hospital in Bethesda, and then he moved up to Pennsylvania and, and got out of the military. And my mom was the school nurse at my school when I was little. And was your father um, in the Navy as you were a child? Yeah, my dad was in the Navy until I was eight. He was in the Navy until 1989. He actually went to the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy in Kings Point, New York, and okay. then took a commission as a naval officer and became a naval aviator and flew in Vietnam and then came back and went to medical school, still in the Navy, and was a Navy doctor until I was eight. Yeah, and a few moments ago, you mentioned your um, decision to enlist. At what stage did that happen? Was it immediately after high school or during college? It was pretty soon after high school. I I actually got kicked out of high school. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so I had some trouble in high school, and I actually got kicked out of high school in my senior year and had to repeat my senior year of high school at a military school. Okay. So that's where I learned that I could march and I could shine my shoes and I could do well within that highly structured environment. And then I went to college and I failed out. So I relapsed in a, in a certain sense. And that's when my parents said, well, I hope you had fun because you're not getting any help from us anymore. So whatever you do with your life, you're going to do it totally on your own now. And so what happened was I was working a couple of crappy retail jobs and I came out of work one morning and went to the parking lot and found a flyer for the Virginia Army National Guard on my windshield offering full college tuition at any state school in Virginia and a, and a stipend for books and living expenses for the low, low price of one weekend a month and two weeks every summer. And I said, that sounds pretty good. I could probably do that. And so I called the recruiter and I had signed the paperwork before I even really knew what I'd done. And that was July 27th, I think, 2001. So a little less than six weeks before 9-11. Yeah, the world was about to change dramatically. Talk about yeah. that. How did the, the deal sort of change for you from a weekend a month to something far more intense? Well, it changed really quickly. So I shipped off to basic training in mid-October 2001, so very hot on the heels of 9-11. And when I was in basic training at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, all of the drill sergeants were telling us, you know, you're going to be on a plane to Afghanistan as soon as you get out of here. So sure. you better take this seriously. And, and we were all sure that we were going to go to Afghanistan, but then Afghanistan went on the back burner pretty quickly. And all of a sudden there was talk of sending troops to Iraq. And so that was, I got out of basic training in the spring of 2002. And then I did a couple of semesters at college and by the 
autumn of 2003, my unit was getting mobilized to go to Iraq. Well, talk about your, your experience in the service in, in Iraq. You know, you've described it in various places as a relatively safe deployment, but yeah, you know, talk about that. Yeah, well, I had the good fortune to serve in a part of Iraq that hadn't been severely affected by the Sunni insurgency yet when I was there. It was starting, but things around Mosul, which Mosul has become a household name for a lot of people now because of the fight between the Iraqi government and, and U.S. forces and ISIS um, in the Obama administration and the Trump administration. But in 2004, when I got to Mosul, it was pretty quiet compared to the Sunni Triangle down near Baghdad and, and some of those places. So all of that started to change toward the very end of my tour. And there was a suicide bombing on December 21st, 2004 at the chow hall of my battalion headquarters where my battalion was. And I wasn't at that base. I was off at a satellite base, but a lot of my friends were there. And, and two of the young guys from my unit got killed that day and a bunch more got wounded. And, and so things were already very real before then. But, um, you know, I, I came home from that experience realizing that life in a certain sense is not actually precious. That was a big turning point in my life where I realized that you can have all these dreams and all these things you want to do with the rest of your life and this vision of your future. But the reality is that you can be obliterated in a second in spite of all of that. So I went back to the U S after my tour, of course, and I went back to college and I became a very serious student. I just wanted to study all the time and and a lot of that was me trying to figure out what the hell had happened over there and why we were there and what the history was that led up to that moment and what the consequences might be for the United States and for the world, particularly for the Iraqis in the Middle East. And so that led me to pursue a career in journalism. And so you, you mentioned that because you were an outstanding student at the University of Virginia and yeah, went right into journalism and it was based on this desire to sort of understand the world you had just come from? It was based on a desire to understand the world that I had come from. And it was also based on a desire to go back to Iraq and go back to the Middle East and encounter the people who had been portrayed in such a monolithic way by yeah. various politicians and other people with loud voices in the public mm -hmm. domain to encounter those people without a rifle, to encounter them on their terms and on their turf without a barrier of body armor and helmet and rifle and all of that stuff between us. And I also wanted to tell the story of the young people, the young Americans who were still stuck in these wars, who were still fighting over there, even though most of the country back here at home had moved on. That's a really big part of the reason why I became a journalist is because Journalists tell stories that wouldn't probably otherwise be told in a lot of cases. They go to places and talk to people and, and bring home these stories that would otherwise wither on the vine. And so I wanted to do that. And talk about how you created opportunity for yourself to, to go and be an embedded journalist or a deep, do deep reporting in Afghanistan. Basically, the way that I got into it was in my final year of college, I was very fortunate to have an internship at a magazine called the Virginia Quarterly Review, mm -hmm. which is housed at UVA, but is run independently and is a real powerhouse for exactly the kind of journalism that I was most interested in doing, which was long form, creative nonfiction, magazine writing, travel writing those sorts of things. I wanted to be able to write in a literary style. So that's what I wanted to do. And so I got this internship at VQR and the editor at the time was a guy named Ted Genoese who was immediately supportive of what I wanted to do. He said, well, how would you like to write a nonfiction essay for one of our issues about your unit's experience in Iraq? And I said, well, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would love to, but I don't know how to do that. Are you sure I can do that? And he said, yeah, I'm sure you can do it and I'll help you. And he did. So the very first piece that I ever published was a, a personal essay about my tour in Iraq. And it was really centered on the lives and deaths of the two young men from my unit who died 
in the December 21st, 2004 suicide bombing in Mosul. And their names were Nicholas Mason and David Rurn. So I went and I drove all over Virginia, tracking down guys that I had served with and interviewing them about what their lives had been like in the three years since we came home. And I went and visited Nick and David's parents, Nick's parents and, and David's mother, and talked to them about dealing with the grief of losing their sons and and the as much of that experience as they were willing to share with me. And that was a just utterly terrifying experience. I was so unbelievably nervous to enter their homes and ask them to open that door for me. And they did it. And that really set me on the path to doing the kind of work that I am very fortunate to still be doing today, which, you know, third squad is, is a direct continuation of that work that started 13 years ago. Yeah. Maybe this is the appropriate time to, to turn to third squad. I've listened to the first two episodes. They are powerful, amazing work. So the setting is you in bed with the group in Afghanistan in 2011. And now 10 years hence, you've gone on this journey to reconnect with these fellows and to see how their lives have, have trans, you know, what's transpired in their lives since. That's the basic conceit of the program. That's the that's the gist of it. Yep. Yeah. So talk about how this idea came to be. I mean, the episode in 2011, it kind of closed the door on embedded reporting for you, if I understand correctly, yet you've chosen to re reopen it in a way. A bit of the backstory is that I went, I went to Afghanistan for the first time in 2009. And the Afghanistan surge, which was this drastic escalation of the Afghanistan war, really happened in 2010, officially, but there was already a ramping up happening in the last days of the Bush administration and the very first days of the Obama administration in early 2009. So mm -hmm. it was already underway, and everybody kind of knew that it was coming when I was there in 2009. And then I went back four more times over the next two and a half years or so. And I spent a lot of that time embedded with Marines and Army infantrymen. But I also spent a lot of that time on my own. I also spent a lot of that time traveling and, and reporting on what it was like to live in this so-called counterinsurgency war as an Afghan civilian. Mm -hmm. That embed was a final straw for me in a lot of ways. And one of the ways was that the combat that those Marines were engaging in and the horrors that they were surviving were so off the charts and so serious. And by that time, I had accumulated a weight of really grief and anger that I couldn't carry anymore. I, I really couldn't. And I knew that when I got there, I knew that when I was going there, hmm. I knew that I was going there for reasons of compulsion and not really rational choice. Like I felt like if I didn't go, then I would be betraying this mission that I had set out for myself to, sure. you were on a path. I was on a path and I was going to, I was going to keep paying attention to this. Even if most other people weren't, I felt like on the ground, I was just engaged in some kind of bizarre and dark form of Mad Libs. You know, that hmm. game that kids yeah. play in those books where there's blanks in the sentences and you're supposed to fill them in with whatever funny word you can think of. Oh yeah, my daughter's I favorites. felt like I was playing some super, super twisted version of Mad Libs where the names of the villages would change and the names of the units would change and the names of the people who got killed and wounded would change, but the bigger story was the same. And I couldn't stand it anymore. So I did that embed and I did these interviews with these guys and I thought, I got to pull something different out of here. I'm just going to talk to these young guys and try to get a sense of what it's like to be them in the midst of this hell. And so I made a very simple list of questions like, why did you join the Marines? What do you think the Taliban are fighting for? What's the first thing you're going to do when you go home? What do you miss most about civilian life? And I recorded interviews with each of the 12 guys of this one squad that I was basically glued to, third squad. 
and I took portraits of each of the guys with their gear and without their gear. And that became the core of, of what I was going to publish from that trip to juxtapose those images and to have quotes from each of these guys about what they were experiencing over there. So I got home and I sent the film off to be developed and it came back a few weeks later and this was mid-September 2011. And I was so excited to see the pictures because I grew up in the age of digital. So I had instant gratification and, and I know how to set an exposure, but I wasn't sure if they had turned out. And so I ran upstairs and I started scanning the, the pictures and it was taking forever. And I was doing that. And, and I, at the time I was subscribing to all these Afghanistan related Twitter accounts. And I see this notification pop up from the department of defense's Twitter feed. And it says something like two Marines killed in RC Southwest, which is the command region that Sangin was in. And I said, Oh man. And I clicked on it and it was a press release and it turned out to be one of the Marines one of the guys who died was one of the Marines who I had just interviewed in Sangin. Yeah. And the black and white negative of his portrait was sitting there on my desk next to go in the scanner. That was really a breaking point for me where I just took it as a sign that my days of, of going to Afghanistan and doing these embeds and of trying to cover the war from the front lines were over. And I think that saved my life in a way, you know, I've, I've, said before that I think Michael Dutcher, who's the young man who died, that in some ways he saved my life. He helped me figure out how to save my own heart, which is a really important thing to surviving trauma. That was a decade ago and I'm 40 years old now. And over the last decade, I've never really felt good about that decision to turn away full stop. I've always felt like I abandoned something over there. And I've come to peace with the fact that it was the right decision to stop going back. But I've always wanted to tell this story in a deeper way, a story beyond the battlefield about how war lives on in the lives of the pe people who've experienced the worst of it forever. So that's what I'm doing with this podcast, Third Squad, is I go back to all of these guys. I track down the 11 survivors of the squad. One of them didn't, didn't want to talk to me, but I managed to talk to 10 of the 11 survivors and the mother of the guy who died, Michael mm -hmm. Dutcher's mom and his twin brother, and really to ask what it was all for. That's a big question. What it yeah, was all it's for. Huge. I mean, it's... I don't have an answer for you either. But... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be back to my conversation with Elliot Woods after this short break. A New Angle is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and UM's College of Business. Access to capital, broadband, and education are three ingredients any community needs for success. This is Jeff Meese, media technician at the College of Business, and you're listening to A New Angle. Welcome back to A New Angle. I'm speaking with veteran and journalist Elliot Woods about his gripping new podcast, Third Squad. You know, maybe we could pull, pull on a couple of the threads that were particularly salient to me in those first couple episodes. Sure. It is Veterans Day, and you had this exchange with Michael Miner about kind of the ridiculous feelings that you and other people in the service feel when, you know, outsiders like me say, thank you for your service, and that that's a term that gets thrown around a lot. I don't pretend to speak for every veteran on on the planet, but I I know a lot of veterans who find that exchange uncomfortable and really unwanted. I know that most of the time people are saying that with the best of intentions sure. and I respect that and I understand that. However, when you say that you are creating this inflection point in the interaction where it feels like something is demanded of, of the veteran, like there should be some response. And so what am I supposed to say back? Am I supposed to say, oh, thank you? Or am I supposed to say, hey, no problem. Don't mention it. Hey, yeah, no like, big deal. You you're know? welcome. <laughs> you're yeah. welcome. Like for me, when I came home from Iraq, especially as the years went on, and then when I started covering Afghanistan and seeing that war up close, I didn't see that there was anything for anyone to thank me for, particularly with regard to Iraq. You know, I didn't really believe that 
that the combat troops in Iraq and Afghanistan were, quote, keeping America safe from terror, quote, end quote, or, or fighting them over there so we don't have to fight them here. I just didn't believe any of that. And I thought that the truth of what was happening over there, why we went there, why the wars escalated the way they did, was so distant from what many Americans perceived them to be back home that that was really difficult for me and really jarring. So when people would say, thank you for your service, it felt like this gloss on the reality of the wars that made me really upset. It, it was disturbing to me. It was like yeah. a reminder of the disconnect that I just didn't want to deal with. It's like the best of intentions, but it would be better if you just didn't say anything at all. Yeah. I want to make sure we kind of talk about the motivation for the podcast in the right way and, and accurately represent that. I think we've captured some of that, but if we've left anything out in this conversation, I want to make sure we get that in. And then I don't want to do any spoilers, but I'd love to, was there any resolution of, of some kind? I think for me, this sense over the last 10 years that I abandoned this mission that I had dedicated my life to at a relatively young age that was always there in the back of my head. Hmm. Even as I was doing other things that gave me great fulfillment. Part of that has to do with the fact that this guy, Michael Dutcher, who died, struck me when he was alive and I met him as a, as a really special and enigmatic person who I wanted to know so much more about. Even some of his colleagues refer to him as unusual. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, you, I was very affected by his death. And then I sent a CD of images and the audio recording to his family in North Carolina after he died. And I got a letter back from his aunt a few months later that thanked me for sending that. And the aunt said, I had hate in my heart until I heard Michael talking about what he was doing over there in his own words. Hmm. And hearing him talk about the Afghans allowed me to let go of some of that hate. And she said that she was writing on behalf of his mother, whose name is Teresa. And she put Teresa's phone number and mailing address there on the letter. And she said, if you ever want to talk to Teresa, she said that she would be willing to talk to you. And I put that letter away and saved it and said, I'm going to take up that invitation one of these days. And I could just never bring myself to do it. And then years went by and more years went by. And then when the 10 year anniversary of Dutcher's death was coming up, I started thinking more and more about third squad and about this story. And, and so we decided to do it and things really took off from there. And so the question was, have I found any resolution? And this is my long way of getting around to, I went on this enormous journey all the way across the country, but I also went on this emotional and psychological journey that involved turning to face these men and this story that I had, in my own mind, turned my back on for all these years. Right. So I don't feel any better about what happened in Afghanistan. I don't feel any better about the fact that two significant wars transpired over the last two decades in the Middle East and Central Asia where Tens of thousands of people were killed, Americans, Afghans, Iraqis, and everywhere else that the war on terror has spread. And that all of this happened without really seeming to make much of a dent in American culture, without really garnering much notice. I don't feel any better about that. I feel worse about that, actually. Mm -hmm. I, feel a lot, I feel a lot worse about that. But what I do feel better about is having turned and faced the thing that I was running from. Yeah. I got a lot of courage from these guys. That is the thing that I got. I didn't get resolution, but I got a lot of courage. Yeah. And the way that they gave me courage was by being courageous enough to talk to me and showing me what that form of bravery looks like. Yeah. The kind of courage it takes to tell your own true story about unfathomable pain and loss to an audience of thousands or potentially millions of strangers. That is an unbelievably brave thing to do. It's, in my mind, I think it's as brave as running into a gunfight. Sure. 
Gosh, that was a long answer. No, it's, <laughs> it's powerful. Um, I guess, Elliot, as, as we're kind of running out of time here, I mean, tell me, tell us about your colleagues in this project. We're starting this production company, but this pro- this work has also been funded by some granting agencies as well. Tell us about the, the supporters of this work. Yeah, so... My collaborators are Tommy Andres and Maria Byrne, who founded a company called Heirloom Media. Mm -hmm. And we were able to get a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities that was really helpful for covering some of our travel expenses related to the project. So that was a huge help. And I'm really thrilled to have their support and their partnership. And we we are partnered with the center for war and society at San Diego state university on that NEH grant. Okay. Yeah. So where would you direct people to, 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 to listen to this incredible podcast, third squad? How, how would you, um, yeah, where would you point people to find it? Well, the easiest way to find it is just to go to our website, thirdsquad.com, which is spelled out T H I R D squad.com. And if you go there, there's an episodes tab where you can see the episodes. They're coming out weekly every Thursday. You can also just look for Third Squad on your favorite streaming service, whether it's Spotify or Apple Podcasts or the iHeart app, whatever. It's it's on all of them. So all the places and do all, all the, the things: rate, review, yeah. subscribe, share. Yeah, um, rate, review, subscribe, share. Send me your feedback. Send me your criticisms. Tell me your stories. Yeah, all of it. So you've wrapped this project with no resolution, but it, uh, sort of a feeling that you can move forward. As you move forward, what are some of the, the, the projects or questions that you're, you're going to be working on? What's next for me? You know, I don't know. I, I would love to do something lighthearted and funny. I would love to do something that, that allows me to express that side of my personality. And, but I don't, that's just not what I do. <laughs> so, so I don't know, you know, um, there's a story that I've been working on down in El Paso off and on for a couple of years that I might return to. I've got a bunch of ideas that I'm kicking around, but I think the first thing that I'm going to do after these last episodes roll out is just do a bunch of skiing and sitting by the wood stove and reading poetry and novels and playing music and keeping my phone off for at least a few weeks, if not the rest of my life. So I think that's a wise choice, Elliot. Um, <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, it's been Thank a pleasure. Thank you for this incredible work. We encourage everybody to get over to Third Squad and check out the series. And um, yeah, keep track of El- Elliot's other work as well. It's very powerful. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. And thanks for your interest in the project. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. And we're coming to you from Studio 49, a generous gift from University of Montana alums Michelle and Lauren Hansen. A New Angle is presented by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. With additional support from Consolidated Electrical Distributors, Drum Coffee, and Montana Public Radio. AJ Williams is our producer, BTO, Jeff Amet, and John Wicks made our music. Editing by Nick Mott. And Jeff Meese is our master of all things sound. Thanks a lot, and see you next time.